Let's talk about happiness. What countries have really achieved it and why should we care about it? When we look at global rankings, we're often talking about things like purchasing power, military resources, and trade partnerships. But some experts say happiness is actually a better indicator of development and public policy success than other factors. So today we're breaking down the annual World Happiness Report to look at which countries keep topping the list and why. The report, now in its sixth year, is produced by a UN initiative called the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. They've managed to break down a topic that's both fundamentally subjective and hard to quantify. So notice anything about the top 10? Yep, all the Nordic countries are in there. They've all ranked among the top 10 since the report was first put out. And Switzerland, this year's number five, has also always hovered near the top. So what are the factors that rank Finland, Norway, Denmark, Iceland, and Switzerland the happiest countries in the world? We spoke to economist John Hellowell, who has edited the report since the beginning. He said the data were compiled from the World Gallup poll, wherein people were asked to value their lives as a whole, with the best possible life being a 10 and the worst possible being a zero. Economists also analyzed six major factors that they say explains a significant part of it. GDP per capita, life expectancy and health, social support, freedom to make life choices, generosity, and freedom from corruption, or trust in businesses and government. And though we might expect personal or national wealth to be the biggest determining factor, it's not. To be a top-ranked country, it isn't just about being really rich or about being really socially connected or about having a really good government. It's a whole mixture. In the U.S., for example, the GDP increased by more than a trillion dollars over the three years data was collected for this report, but its happiness ranking dropped four spots, down to 18th. Helliwell says social support, freedom, generosity, and trust in institutions are actually the most significant underlying factors among the happiest countries. For people out of work in Switzerland, there are generous unemployment benefits. Most are eligible to receive 80% of their last salary for anywhere from 6 to 18 months. And the Nordic countries all have tuition-free college options, provide versions of universal and in some cases free healthcare coverage, and have a variety of other social safety nets. Norway provides up to a year of full salary paid sick leave. In Sweden, parents are entitled to almost 16 months of paid parental leave per child. That includes those who are unemployed. And in Finland, this year's winning country, the government even provides baby boxes to all new parents, filled with things like clothes, spoons, slippers, and a thermometer. Or parents can choose a check instead. In 2017, Finland also became the first country in Europe to pilot a universal basic income program, under which 2,000 unemployed citizens received a no-strings-attached monthly stipend from the government. I joke with the other Americans that we are living the American dream here in Finland. I just see how well everything works from medical, uh, free health care for everyone, transportation that's really efficient, and really good schools that are free or very low charge to students and their families. And Helliwell says citizens are generally happy to pay the price. Finland, Norway, Denmark, and Iceland all rank among the highest taxed countries in the OECD. Researchers also found overlap between countries with the biggest social safety nets and citizens who feel the most free to make life decisions. Why? Those systems are one that uh, give high level education possibilities to everybody. So regardless of whatever environment you came from, you'll have the same opportunities for education as everybody else. And of course, they're very good systems as well. Uh, and the same thing is true of the health system. But it goes beyond taxation and social services. By this report's standards, social support also means having somebody to count on when you need them. It's what allows some countries to maintain high happiness ratings, even during crises, while others see drastic drops. For example, says Helliwell, when Greece, Italy, Spain, and Portugal went through financial crises around the same time, their reported well-being declined. But in Iceland, where the banking system collapsed, happiness levels stayed high. That's because social capital, or networks of social relationships, is strong. 
in a high social capital region, a disaster happens, everybody comes together and works together in order to put things right again. But the happy countries are the ones that don't play the blame game. Uh, they say, okay, this is a problem, let's see what we can do, all of us. Of course, not all citizens have the luxury of adopting this mindset. In other countries around the world, residents are struggling with corrupt governments, weather-related crises, and poverty. And just because a country makes it onto the happiest countries list doesn't mean it's free of problems or criticism. For example, the Nordic countries have been among those witnessing a rise of far-right political parties and nationalist anti-immigrant sentiment after the European migrant crisis began in 2015. This includes crackdowns on immigration policies and refugees already living in those countries. As discontent over immigration increases, Will these countries see an impact on the happiness of not just their citizens, but also those who are coming to live there? What do you think it would take for more citizens around the world to find a better state of well-being? And who's ultimately responsible for it? Let us know what you're thinking in the comments below. Thanks for tuning in this week to Now This World, and don't forget to like and subscribe.